I'm Wildlife Vet Romaine Petsy. Today I'll be answering your questions from Twitter. This is Wildlife Support. Okay, a question from Osmosis Reads. Do hippos eat people or just chomp on them a bit? Hippos are clearly vegetarians. They only eat grass, so they won't eat the person. They would just mash them up, which would still be fatal, but at least they're not gonna poop you out the other end. At Megabyte PNG asks, how do vets diagnose animals? Like, they can't even talk. How do you know? But remember, even vets that work with domestic animals like dogs and cats and horses, they don't talk either, but they do show symptoms. Some of our wildlife patients are really tricky because they hide their symptoms. So if you're a deer or a capybara or something that may be eaten by another species, you will always mask your symptoms because otherwise, if you look ill, a predator, whether it's a tiger, a lion or a crocodile, might single you out to catch you. And that means as wildlife vets, we have to be aware that if an animal looks completely healthy, it may still actually be injured. And a good example are seals. Seals might have a big fight and one seal might get a really bad crushing bite from another seal, but without punctures to the skin, it's invisible to us. So we can use a thermal camera and that will tell us that there's tissue damage or an infection or an abscess forming and we can treat it quickly before it gets too bad. Question from Egg Salad Screams. Why do big cats have round pupils, but normal cats have slit pupils? I think I solved why tigers are cuter than normal cats. We know domestic cats have slit-like pupils, whereas lions have a round pupil. Now we don't really know why there's this difference in cats. There are several theories, and one of them is that a slit pupil is much more effective for nocturnal animals because they can actually filter out much more light. So you will see seals who are underwater will have a big pupil, but in the daylight can't damage their retina, will have a slit pupil, and so will many nocturnal cats. But then lions are also nocturnal, so that doesn't answer everything entirely. There are also theories about different wavelengths of light being affected by the different parts and the edges of the lens, and that has an effect on how the pupil works. So it's a good question, because we don't entirely know the answer yet. Question from at SUXUPEEL. I would not want to be the one to put an oxygen mask on a tiger for tiger surgery. Hashtag, no thank you. I don't blame you, neither would I. Now, believe it or not, one of the first zoo or wildlife anesthetics was actually a cheetah in London Zoo in 1850 that was anesthetized, not even with a face mask, but with a sponge with chloroform on a long stick. So the animal had to be really sick to allow people to pin it down with ropes and do that. But we'd never do this today on a tiger or a lion. Instead, we would use something like a dart to deliver the anesthetic drugs into the muscle. And only when the animal is really fully asleep would we either put a mask or a tube down to give them oxygen and anesthetic gases. At Blythe Renee asks, does the placebo effect work on animals? Now, that's a really interesting one because we always think that the placebo effect works on people because they don't know they've been given a placebo, but animals won't know that there's even this possibility of effect. However, often there's a person involved. So whether the animal's in a zoo or a rescue center being treated, the thing is the placebo effect may work with the person so that even if it isn't a drug that is working, the person thinks the animal's getting better. However, it gets more complicated because there's an old study that was done in Russia many years ago where they took dogs and they gave them cyclophosphamide, which is a chemotherapeutic drug which crashes your white blood cells. Now they gave this to the dogs in a very specific tasting syrup and the white blood cells went down. And then they stopped and a few months later, they gave them the syrup without this nasty drug in. And interestingly enough, the body reacted and dropped those white blood cells just the same as if the drug had been in there. So even though the animal wasn't aware that this medication was having an effect on its body, somehow the placebo effect had this extreme effect in animals. So it does show you the placebo effect is much more complicated than we understand, and we still have a lot to learn about it, particularly when it comes to animals. Right, next question is from at Nori31. It just came to my mind, and it is confusing me up right now. How do we know the gender of a snake? And how do we know if a snake is a male or a female? So we will use things called sexing probes. So we can hold a snake, we actually insert these right next to a snake's bottom and run them just along the side of the vent. Now a female will only have a very superficial scent gland, but a male, this will slip all the way down the hemipene. And when we pull it out, we can see it's gone in quite a distance, it's a male. That's how we sex snakes, but we have to catch them first. At Max Money asks, how many bones does a giraffe have in its neck? 
Oh, who knows? Well, we do know, and giraffe have exactly the same number of neck bones that we do. They've just become very long. So giraffe's neck bones are about this long. Elisa uh, asks, do vets give animals pregnancy tests? Like how would you know an elephant is pregnant? And this is an interesting question because we need to tell if an animal's pregnant in different ways depending on how its reproductive cycle works. So orangutans and chimpanzees are really easy. We can just use some urine that we've sucked up off the ground on a human pregnancy test. For an elephant, the hormones are very different. So sometimes we need to collect feces and it needs to go to a specialist lab and that can take many days. Some animals like an elephant, we can actually do an ultrasound and actually put our arm up their bottom and do the ultrasound from the inside to be able to reach anywhere because their thick corrugated skin will just not let us get an ultrasound scan from the outside. At Lady Starfire, Ben, age eight, would like to know how many teeth does a crocodile have? I can't count them, but there are many. And the reason is that they will continue to shed and erupt new teeth their whole life. So they're not quite as extreme as a shark, but it makes sense if you're a croc and you twist your prey that you're gonna break and lose teeth and you have to regrow them. But they have a lot more teeth than we do. Real James Coffin asks, what do big cats think of domestic cats? I'm sad to say they won't see them as some sort of relative of theirs in any benevolent fashion, is they're just a big predator that will see a small predator either as competition or as a potential meal. So I think if a domestic cat got into a tiger enclosure, it would be eaten really quickly. At Bell 31W, do elephants from different parts of the world speak different elephant languages? The short answer is yes, but it's more complex than you think. Just like in people, nonverbal communication is important in all animals, including elephants. And so that would be different for the three different species of elephants. So South African elephants, forest elephants, and Asian elephants. But what we also tend to forget is that elephants also communicate through infrasound, which is really low frequency sound. And that carries over very long distances. So elephants very far away can actually hear that poaching is going out in a different part of the country because the elephants in that part that have been poached will let out these low frequency rumbles we can't hear. But elephants close by can actually hear these sounds through their feet as well. So elephants almost have ears in their feet that will pick up part of that. So we don't understand enough to know exactly what is different, but watching elephants interact in places like zoos from different parts of the world do tell us that there are some differences in how they communicate with each other. Rigatoni asks, why do giraffe have antennae? Now I can understand why you would say this because they have these two lumps on top of their head that are covered in hair, but they're actually horns and they use them not so much to fight, but from evolution, that was their purpose. Giraffes now fight by banging their necks together. And so because the horns don't clash, evolution has seen fit to mainly cover them with fur. At Defeating Labels asks, why do I find a snake surgery so interesting? So I guess you find snake surgery so interesting because it's just such a different body shape. They've got one long body cavity with all the organs spaced out in it and they've got no limbs. But probably even more interesting than the actual surgery is how we safely get hold of some snakes. And for that, we often use a snake hook. You may see this being used to either scoop up a snake safely and put it in a bag or a tube so we can use anesthesia, but sometimes we'll actually use this to pin a snake down on a giving surface. But there is a trick to this. We actually are pinning the snake's head itself down and never its neck, because unlike us, snakes actually have a really, really weak junction between their neck and their skull. They only have one little articulation there whereas us and most mammals have two. So we have a much more sturdy connection between our skull and our neck. At Gregory asks, do you know why they say an elephant never forgets? Elephants obviously have a huge brain, much bigger than ours. Now, part of that is to control this unique appendage they've got called the trunk, but they do have phenomenal memories. And I've seen elephants that have come and lived in a zoo and 40 years after they've come from Myanmar, where they were used as a logging elephant, someone has come up to them and suddenly started to give them the old commands in Burmese and the elephant takes a few seconds and suddenly, well, no, I need to lift my foot. 40 years later, they still remember everything that they learned in a different country. That shows you they really do have a good memory. At Mellow Brick Road asks, how quickly do big cats, closest analog to dromosaurs, kill people usually? Now that's not a question that I'd really like to deal with, but if you were to startle an animal, or had an animal escape like a tiger or a lion, the answer is very quickly. These are top predators after all. Dazzo B asks, how is it 2022 and we still cannot fix the broken leg on a racing horse? Now the tricky thing is it doesn't matter how high tech we are, whether it's people or animals, we can't fix everything. People can't live forever and neither can animals. And not every injury 
is fixable. But it is a particular problem for racehorses and also for my patients like Zebra because of how their legs are designed. They're designed very long with all their leg muscles at the top of the leg. So they have this long leg that's very efficient for fast running. But that does mean that if the leg gets a break at the bottom, it is basically just bone with a little bit of skin covering it. There isn't a very robust blood supply and a traumatic break over there with the bone exposed is almost impossible to get to heal because there's no soft tissues to protect those bones. At Missa Cruz, I get to participate in a surgery on a line this morning at Big Cat Rescue, and I'd like to know how to control myself right now. It's all too easy to get tunnel vision into how exciting it is and to forget to work safely. I know this only too well because I once had a tiger wake up on me during the operation and raised its head and had a look at what I was doing. And that's a bit of a scary moment that should never really happen in most cases. Chris Hams asks, how did elephants' trunks evolve? The trick is to go and look at animals that have something maybe slightly similar. So if you look at a tapir, you'll see a tapir has quite a long nose that it can move and sniff. And that's probably how elephants' trunks started. They're a portion of their front lip and nose that has become elongated over time because they could maybe sniff things out and then it became useful for holding things. And over millions of years, that portion of the front lip and the nose has elongated into this amazing organ, the trunk with all its complex nerves and muscles and everything in there. Question from Avril WP. How would you anaesthetize a giraffe? Now the tricky part about the giraffe is actually waking the giraffe up because the biggest risk is the giraffe with that very long sensitive neck and legs, it has to fall down if you anaesthetize it. And then it has to get up without being unstable enough. And if you wake up from anesthesia, you're always a little bit unsteady to not come crashing down again and break your neck or your legs. So often when we move giraffes in the wild in Southern Africa, we don't fully anaesthetize them. We will dart them, give them their anesthetic drugs, and just before they're woozy enough to fall over, we will actually put ropes around their legs and then we will actually reverse some of the anesthetic drugs and then they sort of partially wake up and we can walk them into a very long box on a trailer and we can move them to another national park or do minor treatment. So the trick is if we don't need to anaesthetize a giraffe we don't. Eminem Jacks asks do big cats purr? I bet it sounds like a Harley. It can sound quite loud. So if you sit next to a cheetah that's in a rescue center and they purr, it can be very loud, much louder than your cat. But what's more interesting than purring is actually roaring. That is how we classify big cats versus other cats. Some surprisingly large cats can't roar. So things like cheetah are not classified as a big cat because they can purr and they can meow, but they don't actually have the voice box to roar. Lord Christine asks, why do pigs have curly tails? I'm presuming they mean domestic pigs because most of the wild pig species, whether they're babarusa or warthogs or collared peccary, actually have normal tails that will cover their bottom. And that's really important because your bottom is a very sensitive part of the body. Flies could attack it or another animal could bite it. So your tail is quite protective. Now warthogs will raise their tail when they're running away so they can follow each other and you'll see a mom warthog doing that. But domestic pigs' curly tail is something that we've probably bred them for. Because a long tail, when you keep farm animals quite close together and they tend to have squabbles, they end up biting each other's tails. And with pigs, what'll happen is that infection will spread up the tails into their spine and they'll end up paralyzed. So over hundreds of years, farmers have bred our domestic pigs to be really different to wild animals. And one of the things is to have a small curled up tail that is out of the way from being bitten. So it's not a natural thing. It's something that we've selected animals ourselves to have for our own purposes. DNA Heligrace asks, do big cats like tigers and lions cough up hairballs? Do they lick themselves clean the same way house cats do? I'm just imagining a big old lion hunched over hacking up the biggest hairball I've ever seen. Big cats definitely groom themselves just the same as domestic cats. Most of the time though, they've got a big stomach and a small amount of hair they're grooming after every time they have a meal and that just disappears out in the poop. And it's only very rarely they bring up a hairball. Thank you for watching and that's it from Wildlife Support.